Here at Sovereign Hill, we gather on country of which members and elders of the Wathaurong community and their forebears have been custodians for many centuries. For tens of thousands of years on this land, Aboriginal people have performed ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal. We acknowledge their living culture and their unique role in the life of the region. So welcome everyone, I'm Gillian Marsh, I'm the Museum's Director at Sovereign Hill and I'm delighted to see so many people here tonight, including Adrian Doyle, President of the Sovereign Hill Museums Association, members of the Sovereign Hill Board and our Acting CEO, Emeritus Professor Terry Lloyd. I'd like to welcome our guest lecturer this evening, Professor Joy Demusi. We're very excited to have you here and that you're able to accept our invitation to speak tonight. We're also pleased to welcome Janice Bate and members of her family. This is the first time we have held the lecture since the passing of Weston, and it's wonderful that the Bate family could come along and continue to support an event that Weston enjoyed so much. I'd like to thank Brooke and Michelle from Auslan in advance tonight. They're going to be interpreting for any of our guests who might be hearing impaired. This is the third time we have included Auslan interpretation at the Weston Bate Lecture, and it's an important part of our access and inclusion initiatives. This lecture has been held every year since 2010, and each year Western Bait attended, taking the opportunity to catch up with friends and debate the finer points with the guest speaker. Tonight we've invited a former CEO of Sovereign Hill, Peter Hiscock, to pay special tribute to Western Bait, who passed away in October 2017. Peter was the CEO at Sovereign Hill between 1980 and 2002 and knew Weston very well, having worked with him on many different projects. Please join me in welcoming Peter to give a memorial speech on behalf of Weston's Sovereign Hill family. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, I've been given 10 minutes. I know I'm not the main act, so I'm going to stick, stick to that. Um, it's very fitting uh, at this uh, lecture, the first after Weston died nearly 12 months ago, that something should be said about Weston, and I'm honoured to do so. So to Janice, to each of Tristan and James and, and Nicholas, and I, I think I think there's only three <laughs> tonight. Um, I'm uh, delighted to be doing this. Um, <clears throat> Weston was a personal friend in the end. Over a period of 30, 35 years, really, uh, he became that. Uh, and in matters of history, really a guiding star, because as everybody knows, I'm not a historian. Um, his uh, energy was impressive, absolutely impressive, but so was his empathy for people. Uh, he, at the same time, he was a scholarly, insightful writer, but he had that easy manner with people and, and really um, putting people at ease. Um, here in Ballarat, we have the great legacies of um, Lucky City and uh, Life After Gold, uh, I had the honour of launching the latter at the Ballarat Town, Town Hall uh, in 1993. And uh, at the end of the uh, opening uh, at the Town Hall, we came back here and I, I hosted dinner at the Charlie Napier and Keith Dunstan, Weston's friend, made this rather wonderfully witty speech talking, talking about knockers uh, and, and scribblers. And uh, it, it caused us later to ask Keith uh, to uh, open a building here, which happened to be the undertakers. Um, <coughs> uh, and you can imagine what got opened. Um, uh, it's tempting, therefore, to take a Ballarat-centric view of, of Weston, but his influence was broad, wide indeed. Um, I remember Weston being at a three-day conference in Canberra where major historians had been assembled from Geoffrey Bolton in the West to uh, Professor Carboys, people in, in, from Queensland and New South Wales. Weston was in his element. And uh, you might well ask why was I was there. Well, I wasn't saying much, I was listening. 
and uh, Western, of course, in talking about the Celtic influence in forming this Australian nation, um, and uh, then the nature of the people once the gold rush came and we got this more literate society coming in. So, so uh, a terrific um, contribution to that. And he came into his element just a few years later when the, it was decided that the opening exhibition for the National Museum would be uh, Golden Civilization. Um, <clears throat> In Victoria, the Muse Museums Act of 1983 brought into being a Museums Advisory Board, and Weston was a terrific chairman of that board. Um, uh, in its first four years, it wrestled with, um, and I was on it, it, we wrestled with an accreditation system, and in the end, Museums Australia took that on, uh, and much of the intellectual input of that actually came from Roger Trudgeon, who was then the head of the Arts Ministry in uh, Melbourne, and I was later offered him a job up here uh, to run the Gold Museum. Um, Weston, in his chairmanship of the Museum's Advisory Board, and in his subsequent years as President of the um, Royal Historical Society of Victoria, was a terrific energizer. If I have one lasting um, not just memory, but, but, but influence of, of Western, it is the way he could really energise things. Never the aloof academic, he had a natural empathy with, uh, with those he worked with, and this extended to the myriad of volunteers beavering away in small historical society museums around the state. As well, he, he, um, he really used his great diplomatic skills in forming the Maritime Museums Association of Victoria, which was an affiliation of about eight separate bodies, uh, one of whom said, we are the National Maritime Museum, and it needed a, a fair bit of care and conciliation. But with the Royal Historical Society, he strengthened its journal, he convened annual conferences, and he instigated History Week. And we've just had History Week. The History Awards were last um, Monday. Um, and uh, his influence there was both scholarly, uh, it came from a profound understanding of the people he was writing with, uh, writing about. And I think he works like uh, what made Victoria different, which was a wonderful article in the Royal Historical Society. Um, and uh, of course, Weston was at, at the same time writing other works, writing a book on the lanes of Melbourne, writing Mum and Dad Made History, uh, um, the, um, the one on the Mallee, what the heck was that called? Um, thank you, yes. Uh, so, um, uh, he, he, and many others. Of course, he was also doing the history um, of Geelong Grammar and Melbourne Grammar. Um, so, I'd, perhaps in conclusion, should say something about his influence on Sovereign Hill. Fortunately, in the early planning work by the fledgling Ballarat Historical Park Association, chaired by Doug Cowles, that their early thoughts on what they're going to do with this historical park and Western's research into Lucky City, which was published well after Sovereign Hill opened, about 1978, were concurrent. And um, Weston was gathering a lot of primary data and in so doing was able to bring to the attention of Doug's board businesses like the Bilneys or uh, Browns, which might possibly be relocated. But principally, it was Weston's enthusiasm for recreating Main Street as close as you could that I think was a major influence, something he conveyed to David O'Sullivan principally, but to others. In my 22 years here, Weston was closely involved in three big projects. Um, first in the Gold Museum, a Eureka exhibition there. Then in the mid 80s, we built an orientation centre and he was closely involved there. And then we broke fresh ground with the Sound and Light Show Blood on the Southern Cross. And uh, 
In each of those, Western was terrific to work with, um, but just as crucial to their success was our own people. I felt immensely proud of them, John Zulik and Mary Akers and Michael Evans, and then a whole myriad of staff that helped put the whole thing together. So um, uh, perhaps the final flowering of that combination was building the Red Hill Mine, which drew on a chapter in Weston's book. Well, with Weston and Janice, Yvette and I shared many memorable occasions, both here in Ballarat, in the countryside on tours, down on the Mornington Peninsula, or uh, a notable one at Ballura, when Weston's book of poems, beautiful poems, uh, The Haphazard Quilt, uh, was launched, and half the Meyer family turned up uh, there for that uh, launch. It was sure a big launch, and, and those such, such beautiful works. Um, he was a big, uh, a bright star, but stars have to set, and it's fitting that this annual lecture, itself a splendid idea of Tim Sullivan, helps us recall something of the firmament of that bright star. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for those lovely words about Weston. I'd now like to invite our talented performers, Terence Fitzsimons, Andre Prince, and Barry Kay, supported by Vicky Rowe on piano, to present a piece called Local History in a Global World, a quizzical entertainment. serious business of the evening, let us first consider this wonderful noun, history. Uh, someone wrote, history is the stories we tell uh, about outcomes. And my dictionary comes close to that, stating history is a relation of incidents, a narrative, tale, story. Yes, the Irish author, uh, Fenton O'Toole, he has a rather more cynical view of the subject. He has written, these stories are not fully true and they change over time. <laughs> Wasn't it Frederick Nietzsche that, that, that claimed that uh, collecting facts was a sterile shoot? Hmm. Uh, yes, but, uh, well, perhaps. But there's this little piece of Irish history uh, which may be a case in point. Shall we? Here's another now, a 
proper one that calls for consideration. Ah, yes. Ballarat. From, from early on, you see, Ballarat was considered very improper. Indeed, so much so that a New Zealand newspaper in 1852 mm -hmm. reported some very disturbing news. Mm -hmm. It read, We have all along been expecting, what we have all along been expecting has come to pass. Blood has been shed at the Ballarat Higgins. Mm -hmm. And lynch law and its very worst forms are springing up. The Ballarat field is adding victims to the bloody depraved appetites of the gang of vagabonds who are now congregated there. <coughs> That's you. I'm 
murder and robbery that got us noted overseas. An Austrian gentleman, having visited Ballarat during the 1850s, when back home, wrote in the Ostdeutsche Post, Ballarat is a hideous nest between, mountain, between sand mountains where kangaroos crash and the culture says, good night! <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> you talk about things slowly, yeah? <laughs> I've been to Waterloo. Oh, I can see that, yes. Yeah. Well, that, <laughs> Afghanistan. I can tell you a thing about this here place. Mm. This here place. Mm. Yeah, right. <laughs>
Americans have not yet forgiven us for our contribution to the California rush, Sydney ducks, Sydney coves, and such like. Mm. Uh, the New York Herald in March of 1853 gleefully and incorrectly reported, miners rushing place to place the cause of a falling off of the quantity of gold. And while 4,278 arrived at Valor to dig for gold, 815 left. Mm -hmm. Others express a more positive view um, of Ballarat. And you can help, perhaps. Professor Joy Demusi. Joy Demusi is a professor of history in the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies at University of Melbourne and is the current president of the Australian Academy of the Humanities. 
She's the author of numerous books, including The Labour of Loss, Mourning, Memory and Wartime Bereavement in Australia, Living with the Aftermath, Trauma, Nostalgia and Grief in Post-War Australia, Freud in the Antipodes, A Cultural History of Psychoanalysis in Australia, which was the winner of the Ernest Scott Prize, and Colonial Voices, A Cultural History of English in Australia, 1840 to 1940. Joy is the current editor of the History Series for Melbourne University Press and also with Philip Dwyer, the general editor of a full volume, World History of Violence. Her current research includes war, trauma and post-war Greek migration to Australia, sound in the two wars and child refugees in war. Joy is a strong proponent of the importance of local history and it's my pleasure to welcome her tonight um, as our special guest speaker. Please welcome Professor Joy Demusi speaking to us about Ballarat local history in a global context. Thank you very much. Um, I feel I should sing this lecture now after that uh, entertainment. I've never actually sung a lecture before, but uh, yeah, that was a that was a wonderful prelude to um, to the talk tonight. Um, before I begin, I too would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners uh, of, and the custodians of the land on which we're standing and uh, pay my respects to the Wathrunga people, um, uh, elders past, present and emerging. It is of course a great privilege and a great honour to deliver this lecture, the Western Bank Memorial Lecture, um, and in so doing to honour the work and contribution of Western um, to the history profession and also to broadening through his scholarship our knowledge of the past within local, global, national communities. Um, obviously, as we've noted, the lecture is special because it is the very first one um, where Weston is not present um, and we will be honouring him in his absence tonight. I knew Weston a little. Um, I missed him at the university. He'd well and truly gone when I arrived in 1992. Um, but I had a little bit to do with him through the Royal Historical Society of Victoria. And as a young historian, you recall and remember and really never forget those um, scholars, established scholars, who are encouraging and inspiring. And I'm delighted to say, of course, that Weston was one of those historians. He never taught me. Uh, I didn't have direct contact with him. But in the contact I did have, he was always passionate about my work. He was always interested in what I was doing. Not necessarily uh, interest that he had particularly uh, at the time, but I think it's a measure of the, the, the scholar, the gentleman, the man, that he took such interest and was such a great mentor to so many historians, many of, you, many of whom have given this lecture, so it's a great honour for me to follow in their footsteps and to um, honour Weston as well. So tonight what I want to do is um, salute on uh, Weston as a pioneer and a trailblazer in his scholarship by picking up, if you like, his topics and his interest in Ballarat and local history, but giving it a slightly different inflection and an inflection I hope you'll find engaging and, and interesting tonight. Um, so just to remind everyone, um, I, don't, I know you won't need reminding, and um, the, you know his work, uh, Weston's work was mentioned a bit earlier, but just to remind everyone that in that seminal work on the first generation of Ballarat, Lucky City, Weston focuses very much on the community uh, in the Ballarat goldfields and looks at how the town became the centre. This town became the centre for the development of technology, political activism and national identity. Um, he also looks at the environment, and this is a really interesting angle, uh, to looking at the environment and the relationship between the hinterland and the city's history and the area around it as a major theme. So massive gold deposits, the fine soils, the good rainfall and magnificent forests stimulated extraordinary economic activity and produced a resilient society. It's a major work, and it's still a landmark work, I have to say, um, of these themes and this city and more broader questions around the environment and its intersection with city and, and so on. In the subsequent work, Life After Gold, Weston took us into, of course, the 20th century, where the Ballarat story takes a very different turn. Mining, of course, petered out, as we know. The two most important factories were closed in the area. Forests had gone. Many young men were slaughtered in World War I. 
the city was decimated. Um, in each of the de decades from 1901 to 10 and 1911 to 20, lost about, he estimates, 10% of its population. And the social institutions, the industrial skills of the population, the agricultural and pastoral hinterland, um, as well as the fine urban uh, infrastructure, um, meant that the city began to um, pick itself up. These all helped to sustain the city during the population decline and underpinned its expansion during and after World War II. And the boom in tourism, as of course we all know being here, has of course um, been a major factor in Ballarat's continuing success and great prosperity. The title of my talk tonight, as you've listened to the songs, um, uh, is Ballarat, a local history in a global world. And what I want to emphasise tonight is to pick up on some of these themes that Weston developed in his very fine scholarship and look at the intersection between the local and the global in shaping a town like Ballarat, bringing out its dynamism and ever-changing history. And in framing the talk in this way, I'd like to move the history of Ballarat from a, le from a lens, now this is a little bit sensitive here given where we are, away a little bit from gold um, and it is a gold town. Hugely important, of course, as that is, um, and its history. But, but and, as, and to mention gold, but also to look at some of the what we might call transnational events which shape the town and which, of course, include the um, extraordinary history of gold, but goes also beyond it. So I want to sort of open up the history to, to reflect on, on these developments and these intersections. And I guess it gets, this question gets to the question of scale and, and what historians do with scale. I think it's timely to think about scale and size in a way because the pendulum um, seems to have swung from large scale questions and analysis of social history in the 1960s to about the 1980s to small scale analysis in cultural history during the 80s and the 90s and back now to, I think, a preference for large scale questions related to globalisation, the global, what we call the transnational beyond nation. And these, is, these sort of developments have happened over the last 20 years of historical scholarship. Uh, so the move in recent times has been to look at um, the circulation of ideas and practices beyond the nation and towards the global. And I think our musicians encapsulated some of that perfectly and brilliantly. With the challenges stemming from world, global and um, transnational history, the nation has certainly, I think, to some extent, lost its privileged position, what we call the privileged position, as the primary scale of analysis. And it's no longer the, the main narrative tool, if you like, um, of historians. This, of course, has consequences. If the nation is no longer the principal sort of narrative, um, we have to look for alternative narratives and to look at a scale of analysis and think of more imaginative ways of connecting the micro with the macro. And this is something I want to do tonight, to connect that micro and macro. So on the question of scale, micro, history, and the use of, for example, biography, um, can link these various scales. Um, in practice, it's not just uh, that we reduce our scale to the micro level of the individual or the city or the town, but that we effectively look at um, a comparative analysis. So the, the sort of looking at this beyond the nation is looking at a comparative analysis. So I think this is very important when we're thinking about um, a town like Ballarat and how we might look at other perspectives beyond um, certain ones that are familiar to us. So looking at history in smaller units, asking larger questions, looking at wider developments is something I want to uh, think about tonight and reflect on. So it's to this um, intersection uh, of the local and the, and the, and the micro uh, to the global that, that I'll begin this talk. Um, so, let me start, sorry. Oop, wrong way. Uh -uh. The other way. Okay, so this is the title slide. And I've selected the image here. I've selected this image as it reflects, I think, an individual's encounter with the wider world through war. Now, I'll come back to the First World War, that cataclysmic event that shaped a generation and, and beyond. So flags in front of the house there on the top slide include the Australian, the British and the French flags, 
showing, I think, this internationalism that came to Ballarat, it came to everywhere in the world, nowhere was untouched by the impact, medium, short, long term of the Great War. But this image in particular grasped my imagination because I thought it beautifully captured what I'm trying to look at, which is, you know, Ballarat in this context. So the description for this image is family members at a welcome home party for Michael James Francis Cummins in Havelock Street, Ballarat, after his return from World War I in August 1919. This house still stands today. Michael Cummins sounds like a typical Aussie larrikin, or at least a colourful character, we might say. He enlisted when he was 20 years old. He's a, he was a warehouseman from Ballarat uh, and enlisted on the 7th of July, 1915. He was made a gunner in the 12th Army Brigade and was transferred several times during his service, uh, including time with the 58th and 60th Battalions. He served in France uh, without significant injury, but was hospitalised with sexually transmitted disease and later um, a, a sort of eye condition that was caused by venereal disease, trauma to the eye. He was also disciplined several times for drunkenness and being absent, absent without leave. He embarked for Australia in July 1919 and arrived on the 20th of August. So his own story, I think, gives us immediately a sense of the place of individuals from Ballarat, of course, on, on the global scale in World War I, and said, I'll come back to that. He, of course, was one of the lucky ones. 4,000 men enlisted uh, for war from Ballarat and the surrounding district, all around here, with about 800 killed. And if there, were the, there was a global event which has shaped local communities, is, is this one, of course, the first global war. Uh, and the second image down the bottom there is of the celebrations outside the Ballarat City Hall on Armistice Day, the 11th of November to, um, 1918. Of course, very soon, in almost exactly a, uh, a month, we will be celebrating the centenary uh, of that event of Armistice Day. And you can't see it, but there are British and Australian flags, of course, flying simultaneously at that great event uh, marking the end of the, the Great War. The war, of course, is a quintessential example of Ballarat and other local communities and the impact it had on them. And as I said, I'll come back to, to that event. But let me go back in time a little. And, and talk about the 19th century. And of course, the defining narrative, the defining event of the 19th century was the Great Empire, the British Empire and colonialism. And Ballarat, like every other city, was profoundly affected by this global uh, extraordinary event. William Bramwell Withers wrote a book in 1870 called The History of Ballarat. Uh, and he begins his book... Oh, I just want to take it there. Um, he begins his book, Ballarat is one of the wonders of the 19th century. Young in years, it, its mutations have been many and rapid, and its marvellous progress has given to it a seeming antiquity beyond its urban years. Well, this is a very interesting character, and I think it's, again, through biography, we can look at these trans, transnational, these international, global, local uh, intersections. He came to Melbourne in 1852, uh, and the Australian Dictionary of Biography entry uh, describes his travels to Ballarat. And they're up there. Attracted to the Australian gold discoveries, Withers reached Melbourne in the Hannah in November 1852. He walked to Ballarat, but failed as a prospector and soon returned to Melbourne, where he found shelter at Canvas Town and worked as a roadmaker. He was later a dray driver and clerk on the wharfs. In 1854, he joined the Argus as a reader and then as a reporter, but soon transferred to the Herald. By June 1855, he was back in Ballarat but still could not find gold and worked as a reporter and part-time compositor on the Ballarat Times. Um, and in September 1855, he joined the newly founded uh, Ballarat Star. So at this point, an interesting character, an interesting global figure, and as we know here, many global figures travelled to Ballarat during the gold period. But I think it's interesting through with us, we can look at um, also um, the other major uh, event at this point, the um, years of European settlement uh, and colonial uh, colonialisation. 
So uh, acknowledging the um, Wathurrung people who inhabited the uh, area northwest of Melbourne, and we'll go forward here, um, including Geelong, Melton and, and Ballarat. Archaeologists, of course, estimate uh, the human existence of this group for um, this community for uh, 25,000 years at least. So pastoralists began occupying these lands from 1835. And I think the further point to make here is that by 1840, Europeans had, of course, dispossessed the indigenous population almost completely. As the case elsewhere, the settlers introduced smallpox and influenza, and this, of course, had a devastating effect on the communities um, of, of these local communities. So if we're looking at key themes like the global British Empire, the local colonisation, um, we also would look at other dates, which include, uh, in 1857, uh, 1837, sorry, uh, Thomas Livingston Learmouth with his uh, young squatters climbing Mount Buninong. Uh, there, there he is. In 1838, the first white settler, Archibald Yule, calling his property Ballarat. Uh, the Yule family originating from Scotland and setting up 10,000 acres of sheep grazing farm. Of course, in 1851, gold being discovered, and 1852, Ballarat being proclaimed uh, a township. So this, I think, I think, thinking about these sorts of intersections, um, the British Empire weaves its way throughout the world in this way, in, in the way of uh, its relationship to the local communities, to indigenous populations, and um, we would know here that the events of 1854 took place um, on Wuratrang land, uh, and here the clans lived in the vicinity of the Eureka diggings. So this, this is a very rich, very rich uh, history, and one, I think, which, um, when positioned internationally, really gives, um, gives a, a wonderful sort of layering to Ballarat history, as well as contributing to our understanding of the impact of the, of the British Empire and colonialism. So I think, I think um, looking at this story through individuals like, um, uh, like Withers um, really opens up our understanding of, of, of the impact of a, a sort of biographical approach to looking at these histories which takes us um, really into the detail of the local, the global, the national, and the international. Of course, um, uh, of, course uh, Bella, of course, the gold rushes are an exemplar of this history. Large volumes of gold were discovered, as we all know here, relative to California and in other parts of the world, attracting migrants to the colony. The image of this board game, which um, dates back to 1855, is really, I think, fascinating about the global journey in search of gold throughout the British uh, colonies and throughout the empire. And I think when you look at board games like this, and I've got a few others to show you, uh, dating back to the 1850s, they're fascinating because um, they take the players uh, through the trials and tribulations of the of the diggers and the and the um, the uh, the diggers who were on the on the on the gold fields, but also uh, the challenges they had in coming here. Um, this is also a wonderful example of a popular culture, and also. Um, in, in, in imparting history uh, at an everyday level. Um, the context in which people played these games is really interesting, who played them, um, families and children and adults. But I think um, they're, they're a wonderful, wonderful uh, a, a source of, of not only history, but telling us how embedded these ideas were about, about empire um, to ordinary, everyday people. Uh, yeah, so it's called the Race to the Gold Diggings of Australia Ball Game, 1855. So, as you know, migrants came from right across Europe, including European Jews here, Germans, Russians, Polish, the Danes, Italians, and the French. The majority, of course, were British, but the world came to Ballarat in very exciting and dynamic ways, enriching this community, enriching the Australian nation more generally uh, over time. And we can see that, of course, by looking at um, the group that we know um, came in large numbers, and that is the Chinese. Um, and this new era of Chinese migration really set the scene for um, a range of uh, questions and issues that were to develop and, and emerge in the 20s, or much later, into the late 19th and early 20th century. So the discovery of gold ushered in an era of um, large uh, Chinese migration 
Now the title of this slide um, is the Chinese term for New Gold Mountain in Australia. Um, Old Gold Mountain referred to California and deposits of gold had largely been ex exhausted by the mid 1850s. For the Chinese migrants, Australian gold fields, especially Ballarat, represented a whole big new opportunity for discovering um, their fortunes. So you see there, um, the rush attracted many Chinese to Australia, uh, and in this particular scene, the Chinese and European diggers looking for gold uh, at various using various devices and techniques. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful image. And interestingly, um, it's an image of, of, of harmony. Um, we know that uh, there were many um, conflicts, you know, conflicts on the gold, uh, gold fields between various ethnic groups and with the Chinese. But I thought this extract was really interesting um, from the age in uh, November 1855, which describes um, the Chinese in Ballarat, and it gives a, generally a very positive review of the Chinese camps. Uh, all but military order, a number of petty disputes, but nothing that disturbed the peace outward proprietary and good fellowship. Significantly here, I think, is the wider impact of Chinese migration to the gold fields and, of course, what followed, which were the racially uh, restrictive immigration legislation passed through Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland, and later, as we know, through federal um, parliaments. Um, the anti-Chinese sentiment, we know, informed these, these um, relations and these events. And, and later informed, uh, as I say, uh, government policy. But this was a really interesting account of, uh, counter to that, of good fellowship, outward proprietary and harmonious relations. Ballarat became the centre of these, these events and these, uh, these relationships as they, they emerged at the local and the, and the national level. I think another way of looking at um, the history of Ballarat in <coughs> In a, in a way that looks at broader questions, um, we would be familiar with the Eureka Stockade and its impact on Australian democracy. Um, and I think that's um, obviously a, a vital part of um, Ballarat's contribution to, to the history of Australia. But it also can be framed, of course, as local rebellion to a global empire. And local rebellion and rebels are littered in the history of Ballarat as they are in any place but particularly here, given these events that we're talking about. So we, you would know that the gold miners in Ballarat in 1854 challenged the colonial authority, especially in relation to minor license and taxation without representation, but also in terms of license hunts and harassments. The rebellion took place through the Ballarat Reform League and ultimately resulted in the Electoral Act of 1856, a remarkable piece of legislation at that time which introduced um, suffrage for male colonists significantly by secret ballot. Um, really one of the f first in the world to introduce voting by secret ballot at that time. And of course the blue and white Eureka flag we know was flown as an act of defiance um, and it is with us today um, and has such um, you know, iconic resonance in our culture. One distinctive aspect to this story that uh, has emerged in time and over time with historians looking far more into, into, this, um, into the story of Eureka uh, and to insert is a discussion of the role of women, which of course has for many, many uh, years been overlooked as central to the notion of rebels at Eureka, but also um, the role of women generally at this time. So in 1854, one third of the Ballarat population were women and children. And therefore, I think it's ahistorical to write them out of the history of this nation's most formative events. Women were, of course, central to the history uh, of Eureka as editors of newspapers, as poets, as businesswomen, and a whole host of other occupations. There are many notable women uh, we could include here, but let me just mention a few. Uh, Eileen uh, Anastasia Hayes, um, of course, she would be known to to many uh, of, you, of you here tonight. Um, school teacher in Ballarat, um, long time resident of Ballarat, she was there in 1854, believed to have signed the Southern Cross flag that became the rebels emblem. She participated in the events of, of, the, um, of the rebellion. Um, her husband eventually left her, she reared six children. 
Um, she's an iconic figure, a central figure in this story, which I think, and who has uh, in, in up until fairly recently been sort of written out a little bit of her significance. Um, Elaine Young, a writer, um, uh, publishing politically charged poetry and letters to the editor in the Ballarat Times, a very vocal and engaged uh, writer at this point. Uh, Clara Seacup, Irish single mother and Australia's first female newspaper editor. Um, and Sarah Hanna, Hanna uh, a, a, a Scottish-Irish entrepreneur activist who ran the Adelphi Theatre, there it is, in Ballarat, which also served as the headquarters of the Ballarat Reform League. I think um, some of the ideas that were circulating around that time about women and about women's role and about um, eventually around women's suffrage were starting to gain traction uh, around this time and within some of these you know, radical organisations. Um, several historians have um, made women's role central to their work. Um, Claire Wright, you know, might know her work. Um, and I think this is a story that still needs to be fully fleshed out, the role of women and how they were active at this time. So to continue the theme of uh, Ballarat and the origins of Australian democracy, and again, this story is so um, extraordinary given uh, the events of 1850, uh, the 1850s, but beyond that, what happened in Australia and how progressive it was in terms of its democratic rights and pushing those for white Australians. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the vis visitors who came to Ballarat um, articulating particularly um, rights for women. Now, this is, um, I've got up there on the slide, um, Vera Goldstein, her trip here to bring the women's suffrage movement to Ballarat in, uh, is, I think, very significant. Uh, so Vera Goldstein, um, as you would know, was the leader very much of the Victorian women's movement, the Victorian women's organisations, several of them um, she led in order to try and push the vote for women. Victoria was the last state to get uh, votes for women, so it was a long campaign. And um, Goldstein travelled the country, but particularly around Victoria, uh, and she visited uh, Ballarat in December 1903. She was a Senate candidate for federal parliament. Um, and according to the Ovens and Murray Advertiser, Goldstein addressed a very large crowd at the Mechanics Institute here during her visit. And this is what uh, it said, the report. The audience filled the hall as tightly as it could be packed and then left a large number of people standing outside with their silver coin in their hand. So Goldstein would charge an entry fee to come and hear her, um, which upset many Ballarat residents, and there were letters to the paper and uh, uh, you know writings about that. Her justification was she did not have the large financial backing of a political party and was <coughs> self-funding her run for the Senate. And I'll continue the quote. Miss Goldstein, who was well received, said she was not at all deceived by the size of the meeting. She was aware that some of them had come to see this <coughs> awful monster. It was obvious to her that her own sex was not entirely with her. And some of the ladies regarded this as an anti-man movement, but it was nothing of the kind. She and they who thought with her held that men and women should work together at the interests of the people. So Ballarat became uh, quite a central platform for Goldstein. She came back several times in her efforts to try and get a seat in the Senate. During the First World War, uh, during the conscription debates, uh, Goldstein returned to Ballarat again, um, attracting large crowds, some voyeuristically, to see what she would be look like as a female, uncharacteristically up on the stage, um, talking about politics and some um, being opposed to her politics and others very much um, supporting her. So she was quite a figure here um, over a period of, say, 20 years visiting, visiting the town. The other high level, more international figure uh, to visit, of course, was Mark Twain. And his visit has attracted quite a bit of uh, interest by, by uh, historians. Again, I think there needs to be more kind of looked at here because he was quite an interesting social commentator, Mark Twain. He visited Australia in 1895 and later published a book on his travels entitled Follow the Equator, um, originally published in 1897, and then later, more recently, in 2010, as The Wayward Tourist. And in Chapter 16, um, Twain discusses his time in Ballarat and the city's rise to prominence. He also reflects on the distinctively Ballarat accent. 
And I'll quote, because I think he's got this really nice uh, perspective on the Ballarat accent. I'll quote, the Ballarat accent is quite free of impurities. This is acknowledged far and wide. As in the German Empire, all cultivated people claim to speak Hanoverian German. So in Australasia, all cultivated people claim to speak Ballarat English. <laughs> Even in England, this cult has made considerable progress. And now that it is favoured by the two great universities, this time is not far away when Ballarat English will come into general use among the educated classes of Great Britain at large. <laughs> it's great. Yes, well, indeed. Let's celebrate that. Its great merit is that it is shorter than ordinary English. That is, more compressed. At first, you have some difficulty in understanding it when it is spoken as rapidly as the orator whom I have quoted speaks it. An illustration will show what I mean. When called, I handed Mr. Little a chair. He bowed and said, Kip. <laughs> Presently, when we were lighting our cigars, he held a match to mine and I said, thank you. And he said, Kip. <laughs> then I saw, Q is the end of a phrase, I thank you. Kim is the end of the phrase, you are welcome. <laughs> Mr. Little puts, no emphasis on either of them, but delivers them with so reduced, uh, re re sorry, delivers them so reduced that they hardly have a sound. All Ballarat English is like that, and the effect is very soft and pleasant. It takes us, it takes all the hardness and harshness out of our tongue, and gives it, uh, gives to it a, a delicate whispering and vanishing cadence, cadence which charms the ear like the faint rustling of the forest leaves. So I'm keen to hear more about the Ballarat English and from, people, from locals here, uh, I'll be listening out uh, later on. It's a wonderful description, uh, I think, of, um, of Twain as he, as he heard the uh, Australian accent and the local accent here in Australia. It's a wonderful, wonderful description and very interesting. And I, I'm, I, th I think the way he talks about it as localised to Ballarat is really striking as well. Um, that were his impressions, and um, I have written about uh, uh, language and elocution, and there is quite a bit of discussion at this time in the 1890s about the distinctive sound of speech in, in, in areas such as Ballarat, uh, out of the metropolitan cities. So that's a, that's a marvellous um, taste of what some of the, you know, other, other parts of um, other commentators have noticed as well. Speaking of oratory, probably uh, Australia's one of, uh, one of Australia's greatest orators, political orators, had a very close association with Ballarat uh, at this time in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and while he wasn't a resident here, uh, born and educated in Melbourne, um, he uh, certainly had a, a very close political connection with Ballarat from Federation. Can anyone tell me who that is? Thank you. Of course, the silver tongued statesman. So, Deacon was born and educated in Melbourne, uh, but he represented the seat of Ballarat in federal parliament from Federation until 1913. Of course, considered one of Australia's founding fathers, he ushered in many firsts during his time as Prime Minister. In 1903, the creation of the High Court. In 1906, uh, the creation of the Bureau of, of Census and Statistics. 1908, the creation of the Meteor um, Bureau of Meteorology. 1908 again, Invalid, uh, and Invalid and Aid Pension Act was established. In 1909, he was appointed, appointed Australia's first international ambassador, ambassador, High Commissioner to the U UK. Um, and aside from Deacon's significant contributions, um, mammoth and monumental as they are, to the young nation, he was also uh, obviously an enigmatic and complex man. He was known as a pers uh, persuasive orator and could hold his own even among a hostile crowd. Um, despite his public persona, he was also a very private person, um, acknowledging in a notebook that aloofness brought about by study and musings always seemed nearer the centre of my urban life than all else I did. Um, he was, uh, as I say, represented this part of the world in politics and parliament, 
uh, and uh, his name was very closely uh, connected to Ballarat for many, many decades. Okay, just to go on a little bit further to talk about global politics, um, I mean, Deakin brought global politics to the region in, in a whole host of ways, um, particularly when he was campaigning, of course, and there are many magnificent um, uh, reports of his oratory. But to go back to the sort of global stage of another uh, event in the early part of the 20th century, and that is um, the Boer War, and here is again a game called to arms. Now, um, this was a um, this was a, a game that was designed and produced in Ballarat by a company called the National Game Company. So um, there are a number of these. This is the first one I thought would be um, really interesting when I was looking into researching for the talk, and I'd not ever seen this game. A uh, military game for two or more players. Uh, and the way it's described is a, a path movement game based on the Boer War. And players begin at number one, quick march, and move down the path onto becoming the commander of chief at number 96 and end at number 100. Call to Arms takes players along a perilous route through battles and adventures during the Boer War. And the board featuring the illustrations of the barracks, the prisoners of war, the hospital, soldiers pulling a cannon uphill, and a mounted troop with one Australian bushman riding uphill towards the city. And I think through this image we can see the impact of the Boer War on local recreational game playing and interest in global events and allegiance ultimately and most significantly to empire. And in a way, this is embedding empire and its influence in, in the local, um, in everyday life. Um, they're, they're, these games were for entertainment, uh, obviously, but um, they're very much echoing themes that I've sort of already identified around empire and its influence in towns like Ballarat. Um, this is another uh, interesting uh, board game, again, uh, coming out of a designer in Ballarat called the Southern Cross, uh, and as a designer and distributor. Um, the image on this slide is of a um, board game designed and distributed from Ballarat. Um, it's called Catch a Kaiser board game, uh, <laughs> 1910, and it clearly taps into the anti-German sentiments with the Anglosphere uh, in the uh, early 20th century. Uh, so, so in this one, the ball game plays begin from one, advance through a wheel to reach the Kaiser with some hazards including aeroplane destroyer, field gun, submarine machine gun rivals, cruisers, and willy along the way. Interesting notion. Um, so I think again through this object we can see that residents of Ballarat were engaged with the, the geopolitics of war. Um, and not surprisingly, um, passive conscript, conscripts in the war. Um, uh, and it also is an introduction, my first sort of slide, I guess, introduction to industry in Ballarat, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. Um, this was an enterprising group of local residents who obviously found board games, uh, had a passion for them and had a talent for them. This was a very popular board game, Catch the Kaiser board game. Um, I haven't ever seen one physically, but uh, it's again bringing geopolitics to Ballarat in a, in a slightly different way, slightly less familiar way that, than we know. All right, so continuing my earlier theme of um, the First World War, which is how I opened the talk, the First World War and seeing the world. Um, Ballarat boy, Private Herbert Vincent Reynolds, was part of the first field ambulance when he enlisted in 1914 at the age of 18, having been a cadet since the age um, uh, of 14. So the online collection that I've uh, looked at contains diary entries and correspondence covering his service in Egypt, Gall Gallipoli and France, and also the period in between Gallipoli and France where he became ill and was sent to hospital uh, in Malta and then in, in, in England. So Private H.V. Reynolds was discharged in 1919 as being medically unfit. He married in 1928 and was later made mayor of, S of Sebastopol uh, on the urban, obviously on the urban fringes here. Now the image on this slide relate to his overseas encounters, including with Turkish uh, prisoners. So he took that photo there. Uh, Reynolds took the photo of Turkish prisoners there. And the ephemera, including a rail ticket from Egypt and theatre ticket from London. So we know that 
Uh, the men who travelled abroad during the First World War were drawn um, in part by the adventure of the war. And um, Herbert Reynolds' story is a, is a very powerful and I think a very um, compelling story about a young man who embarked on a journey that uh, encompassed um, travel and the excitement of travel, uh, conflict and its demands and ch obviously challenges, uh, um, but also the excitement of being overseas. And this, this whole sort of exciting theme, excitement theme is, is one that does resonate in much of the letters and diaries of, of men during the First World War. I was really interested though that uh, uh, as a local, he, um, he, would, uh, he was taking some of these photos, which are really rare, uh, rare images actually, but that he collected and that these, um, these ephemera remains that he collected and, and kept these tickets, which I think is significant about, about his own relationship to travel in the war and the world as he saw it during that time. Okay, so just following on from that, um, drawing on the digitised letters between Reynolds and his mother in Ballarat, the extract below, uh, and I'll read it, uh, from late 1915 illustrates homesickness, but also enjoying socialising with other colonials in London. And the extract on the slide reads, 4th of November 1915. Dear Mother, I believe this mail gets home just before Christmas, and so I must send you these few lines wishing you all the compliments of the season. This is the second Christmas which I have spent away from home. Time has seemed to have flown by, and then again, it seems to have been a century since leaving home. How I wish for the time when I get back there again, just to see you all again. But that is wishing for an impossible impossibility, at least. In his next letter to his mother on the 14th of November 1915, he writes about the club rooms in Weymouth, presumably during his convalescence and um, in, uh, overcoming his illness. The club rooms at 16 Regent Street have dining rooms where troops from overseas can, for the smallest cost, have the very best meals served. There are also reading rooms where all the latest colonial papers can be seen and a billiard room. I doubt if there are any more, many more places that can boast of so presentable a gathering of the Empire's troops. You find Canadians, South Africans, New Zealanders and Australians mixing up with one another, relating experiences over tables." End of quote. It's a lovely letter, uh, encapsulating, encapsulating, I think, as it does, his, his excitement at being abroad and his excitement at um, being part of something larger literally the life um, and so I think it's a really nice way to look into that uh, global context connecting it up with Ballarat through biography and while we're talking about the First World War the other great event uh, cataclysmic not as much as the war itself and the battlefields of course but the other massive event that took place here and around the country with such intensity was the conscription campaigns during 1916 and 1917 and as you, many of you would know, um, the then government uh, was keen to uh, ensure more reinforcements sent abroad, but um, he, Billy Hughes, the then Prime Minister, couldn't get that through Parliament, so he, um, he announced a referendum in 1916 and then again in 1917. And arguably these two events were the uh, two events or two major events that divided the nation like none other. Uh, the yes and the no campaigns were as intense um, and they were equally intense um, and I think um, it's fair to say uh, definitely Ballarat was um, affected in, in obviously in ways that um, were spread throughout the country. So Ballarat voted no in uh, the, both the 1916 and the 1917 uh, referendums but like, uh, like um, elsewhere uh, Many of the, the votes were actually quite close. Uh, you probably can't see the figures there, but in some areas, particularly Ballarat North and Ballarat West, uh, there were uh, really, really close figures. So it wasn't by any means a unanimous kind of clear cut um, uh, result here in Ballarat. Uh, the papers were full of it. And um, in 1916, the Prime Minister, Billy Hughes, uh, came to Ballarat, gave many speeches, uh, talked uh, at length about uh, the need to, for the uh, yes case, but um, you know he didn't hold sway here at least. Uh, 
Victoria went one way, one vote, the other way, the other vote. Uh, so Victoria voted uh, yes and then no. Uh, and so it was, broadly speaking, as a statewide phenomenon, uh, again, very close. Um, it's, it's a wonderful way uh, looking at Ballarat and, and the local uh, expressions of this global story, this uh, national story about sending men to war, because you do get these magnificent um, cases of the family I just mentioned, um, and looking at the local to amplify global themes and the intersection of those and the way people's lives were so profoundly affected. Uh, the conscription campaign arguably destroyed the Labor Party. Uh, they were only in power very briefly ever again until the Second World War. Uh, there were wider political implications and there, there were wider political, political implications at the local level as well. Um, but at that national level, it, it absolutely reverberated for decades. So um, looking at conscription as a, as a, as a theme in, in the local community is a, is a wonderful way of you know, looking at what is happening to the country as a whole. I want to continue this, this, this question and the story around war. I mean, obviously, these are cataclysmic events and they affect families so directly. Um, the next slide is really about World War II um, and with the arrival of the American forces in World War II. The, um, funnily enough, the VFL photographer Charles Boyles travelled far and wide photo photographing American servicemen anxious to have a photograph to send back home to, to the US. And one of his frequent visits was to Ballarat where the Marines were camped uh, photographing their impromptu um, baseball games. Before I show you any photos of the Americans though, let me just say a little bit about Charles Boyles. Um, and uh, as a Collingwood supporter, I have to you know, um, just uh, uh, request your indulgence. Uh, this is the 1953 Premiership team. And uh, having just survived eight grand finals, uh, losses, uh, I just did feel that if I was gonna put up a photo of Charles Boyles, it had to be of a winning Collingwood team. So I do, do apologize if there are uh, anti colonial supporters in the crowd, I'm sure there are. So Boyles was re is really interesting. He was a commercial photographer working in Melbourne between the late 1920s into the, early, uh, into the 1960s. He took team photos on match days and portraits of players during tra on training nights. He sold his photos to clubs and his son, among others, sold the photos to supporters at the grounds on match days. And, and Boyles took photos of teams uh, for his entire careers. But in the 1930s, he took photos of teams in the VFA, at the, the police league, uh, amateur, uh, amateur um, games and, and competitions. And later his photos included wartime service teams and Sunday league teams. So the one on the, uh, the, one on the far right there is of the, um, of the uh, service, uh, wartime service teams. Wartime services would have teams and play against each other. So he was a prolific photographer and a fantastic photographer. Uh, a lot of his photography appeared in the football record in the 50s, used on football cards and other, other sort of events. So here's a, here's a wonderful photo that Boyles took. And this one is um, of American servicemen in Ballarat. Five American soldiers full length standing in front of an open tent uh, with the soldier in the middle holding a ukulele. Uh, yep. In the background behind the tent is an empty uh, grandstand. Boyles' collection of State Library is wonderful. If, if, if you're ever in the State Library or you're online and you've got a bit of time, wonderful uh, visual material. And a lot of it is around uh, soldiers in Ballarat and, and during the Second World War and, and around here. The Ballarat Gold Museum um, held an exhibition in 2013 marking 70 years since the visit of the US Marines. And according to this article, 15,000 US soldiers visited Ballarat to rest and recover impacting Ballarat's economic and cultural life. And of course, relationships have formed sp some spanning generations and continents. Marines stayed in Ballarat uh, families, enjoying local home cooked meals, playing baseball, um, and really becoming part of the uh, Ballarat community. It's a great, really great story of that intersection of global events impacting on local communities. Some of these soldiers, of course, were later killed in action, uh, and there are um, quite a lot of stories of of, of young men um, uh, with close connections to Ballarat families um, losing their lives. I'm going to move now into the 20th, obviously I've moved into the 20th century, but now post-war, 
um, 56 Olympics and the world of course came to Ballarat in sporting events such as the 1956 Melbourne Olympics and Lake Wenderia hosted nine canoeing and rowing events um, meddling uh, countries such as uh, Romania with three goals, Soviet Union and Sweden with two goals each, and Hungary in the United Team of Germany, East and West with one goal uh, medal each uh, were the results of those, those events. Of course, with any Olympic event, there are many countries involved, and Ballarat was really central to those uh, canoeing and rowing events at the time. Um, a high proportion of the uh, athletes came from the communist bloc, as we, as we know. Um, France, Austria, Denmark, Czechoslovakia, Canada, US, Great Britain, Poland, Finland and other countries obviously participated and were here in Ballarat as part of those events. Uh, it really put Ballarat on the map in terms of uh, this, this particular event. Um, and this one here is in 1956 where it says, overcoats mean the spectators as they watch Bruce Wallace run the Olympic flame out of Ballarat. Um, Okay, so let me just continue. So in the Summer Olympics, um, the image of Gerd um, Fredrickson showing off uh, his two gold medals to the crowd, um, and I think the schoolboy. Now I think the schoolboy from the right is from a local private school. Jan, Bell thank you, Bella Grant Grammar. You can see his uh, his insignia there. Um, yeah, again, positioning Ballarat very much uh, within the global events. Um, and uh, he, won, he won two gold medals uh, as well later on, um, uh, Gert Fredrickson, but showing this off uh, in, 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 in Ballarat, very, ex very exciting for that young man, I'm sure. Um, okay, I'm going to now move fairly swiftly into the post-war years and just reflect a little bit on migration and manufacturing. So linking the Ballarat community and economy with broader trends uh, throughout the West, uh, looking at, say, the growth of manufacturing, the arrival of migrants to look at mine, to complement mining and farming sectors. So, um, it's important to note here that the 1970s saw the arrival of two large multinational food companies establishing their Australian headquarters in Ballarat, um, and further examples of, I think, a global economy emerging, Mars Wrigley Chocolates and McCain Frozen Foods, um, um, sort of both based around here, uh, both of these images are from 1969. So we're moving into a, a global economy, uh, a, a, an economy that's moved out of um, a more localised uh, industry into multinational and particularly food, food companies. And this starts to define, obviously, the history of the city. Before I leave this particular aspect of the talk, um, Migrants in Ballarat in the 1950s and beyond. Now, this is an area of interest to me. I've worked on migration history. I'm currently doing quite a bit on refugee history during the 20th century. Uh, looking at Greek migration, which is my own background, post-1950s in Melbourne and around Australia. And I thought, um, uh, when I was doing research for the topic, I, I wasn't as aware, maybe everyone here is, but the Ukrainian community and its presence in Ballarat. And I thought this is a really interesting story and one that I think needs to be perhaps brought out a bit more that um, the Ukrainian community uh, have been uh, central to uh, Ballarat activities and, and development and so on and so forth. So um, I think that uh, when we're looking at a global story of Ballarat, the global history of Ballarat, uh, obviously migrant groups and their presence here right throughout the 20s, uh, sorry, the 20th century and particularly this particularly rich, rich part of Australian history of migration. So here are just some um, stories of uh, the Ukrainian community in Ballarat and its efforts to um, maintain its cultural heritage, but as well uh, uh, integrate and become part of the Ballarat community. And I think, as again, as I say, writing a global history of Ballarat brings out these sorts of really interesting stories of diversity and complexity beyond Ballarat and it's local to uh, its, its uh, global context. And that's what I've been trying to sort of identify today and look at that. Um, one more slide before I finish, and it's a slightly more um, contemporary uh, reflection, which I think um, is, I think, interesting in terms of where, where we're going. So um, we would all know that the state election is pretty close. And 
the, the future Ballarat, as many people are sort of arguing, may be well impacted by the electoral outcome. The ALP and the coalitions have presented two very competing visions for the state with local impacts for um, the Ballarat region. So for the coalition, should it win government, it's proposing to establish a population commission to decentralise Victoria's population away from the capital to the regional towns. Now you would have all heard a lot of discussion about this actually very recently um, through the Prime Minister talking about this, but these campaigns to decentralise the big cities that have become so populated. Um, this of course is nothing new and there have been past attempts to decentralise the Australian population. Um, and many times they've been, um, you know, incredibly unsuccessful. The goal of this policy uh, proposal is to create a state of cities, not a city state. Um, and while the details are very vague, the opposition has said that it will use a combination of carrots and sticks to encourage people to relocate to the regional towns. And this will be a fascinating new chapter of the history of Ballarat. With its existing amenities of schools and hospitals and transport, uh, Ballarat is likely to become a beneficiary of this policy should um, the coalition win government. A population decentralised, a population, a decentralisation um, population policy may mean that once again Ballarat may become a, a magnet for interstate and, and international migrants with hopes for a better future. The Andrews government is committed to increasing the state's renew, renewable energy sector, aiming to be carbon neutral by 2050. And to reach this goal, the state government with corporate backers have begun construction on the Stockyard Hill wind farm, 40 kilometres south of Ballarat. And once complete, this wind farm will be the largest in Australia, um, powering over 340,000 homes. The Stockyard Hill wind farm um, led to the existing wind farm already operating and developing throughout Western Victoria. And the scale of this industry growth uh, can't be underestimated. In the past four years, eight wind farms um, have been built with you know, over a billion dollars creating jobs and um, other you know, obvious benefits for having that investment. The environmental and economic impact of this investment in renewable energy will be significant, varied and long lasting. And of course, with any economic boom, there may be unintended costs and unexpected casualties. But I think irrespective of whatever the outcome is, change is in the air for, for towns and cities like Ballarat. And I think, again, as a historian looking to the future, are reflecting on where this fits in the chapter in the long and rich history of, of Ballarat. So what I've been reflecting on tonight is to look at Ballarat from a global point of view, to investigate and reflect on the impact international events have had on a community and its individuals like Ballarat, and to cultivate potentially um, Ballarat English. Thank you. It was lovely to be here with Joy. We date back to Melbourne University in the uh, in the in the 80s, and it just it um, just goes to how proud the family are for the various intersections that we have with Ballarat. But I'd particularly like to thank the board at Sovereign Hill, its uh, current and past directors, for the energy that um, Western was able to be engaged with here. The Dad was really into the meaning of life, and he was a man who was uh, really, I'd say not obsessed, but really focused on truth and meaning. But also within his work, he mined into the facts. He uh, was pioneering in observing history through rate books and actually getting to a picture of what existed. Because as we've learned tonight, looking from afar, we create fictional narratives and we're trying, we're trying to actually get to the bones of things. So it's interesting that Weston was a man who brought creativity to the way he, he found meaning in life and then through his great way of, of communicating, writing and engaging. So he not only wrote, he really did touch people and seek to, uh, to bring the meaning to them. So it's just been lovely to see the young Joy de Musi, who I knew in the 80s, following on this sort of great tradition of historians in Victoria that began with Max Crawford and others at the, uh, the post-World War II history school at Melbourne University and indeed at Monash University and through the education systems in Victoria. And we're very, very lucky to be gathered here today with what 
you know, is Sovereign Hill a very intense, engaged, and very, very um, sophisticated historical park with all these narratives which all become quite simplified and understandable to we normal human beings. But just on behalf of my mother Janice and my, the brothers here today, just want to say we're very proud to, to be part of the Sovereign Hill family and to have been involved with this uh, ongoing lecture that honours my father and honours history and narrative. So thank you very much and thank you, Joy. So please put your hands together one more time to thank tonight's entertainers, Terence Fitzsimons, Andre Prince, Barry Kay and Vicky Rowe. Thank you to Peter Hiscock and James Bate for sharing your moving tributes to Weston and the organiser of tonight's event, Sovereign Hills historian, the very fabulous Dr Jan Crogan. <laughs> and Joy, once again, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I believe we've got some flowers and yeah. <laughs> can't leave Sovereign Hill without a hamper, so there's also a hamper lurking for you somewhere oh. too. <laughs> um, and we would also like to acknowledge Janice Bate for visiting us again in Ballarat, and Jan has some lovely flowers for Janice as well. Thank you to everyone for coming and we look forward to seeing you again next year. <laughs>